All right, let's get started. Here's what I want to do for the agenda. So we are going to cover those questions. I'll make sure that I get to that. We're going to talk a little bit about what's going on today's world and what I've seen in the last 15 years since I've been um, running uh, Rapport International. Uh, talk about some internet statistics you might not know because they tie in with language. Um, warning, Will Robinson. Does anybody remember that reference? Space. <laughs> there you go. Um, traducción. You know the meaning of that. What's it mean? Translation. Translation. Stories, because everybody loves some stories. I might ask for some volunteers, too. WordPress, we'll get into that, because we're here for that. Um, some suggestions that I have um, to help you go forward. Cost, otherwise we'll call them return on investment, because smart companies are looking at that way. And then resources that we offer for information when you go forward. So first off, let's look at today's world. 20 years ago, only about 10% of the U.S. population had passports. Now it's up to 40%. And um, accessibility to travel is changing that. Plus also you have the new generation of millennials coming in, who a lot of them have been traveling since they were young, and they're much more into experiences. So we're becoming a global world and more than just the internet has connected us, but it's also an openness that um, we haven't seen before here in the United States. We're also seeing uh, companies become accidental exporters. And it used to be, if you wanted to export, you'd go out and you'd make a plan and you'd have to meet people that were in the country and you'd have to find distributors and you'd have to make a plan as to how you were going to open an office or whether it be in the kind of contractors. And it took a lot of planning and doing and travel. Now what's happening is people are popping up WordPress sites and um, they're getting interest from around the world. So we had a, uh, a client call us up and say, you know, I'm getting a lot of orders from Germany. I'm wondering if I should translate my site into German and what that will do. Went ahead and did, he translated it and then he saw his, his sales go up. So there's a lot of things that, pe that businesses can do as they adjust on the internet <laughs> to get um, business in. And then if they start tracking it and really leveraging it, it's, it's growing. And if you figure out how to do it in one language, it's easier to replicate in others. The other thing that's happening is in the US, um, we used to be called the melting pot. So you've heard of that, right? People came, came in, they wanted to push away their language and culture, they wanted to assimilate quickly, learn English and try not to stand out. Well, that has completely changed. People are coming to the US, they're keeping their language, they're keeping their culture. It's making life a lot more fun. It's more like a mixed salad where things aren't just mushed together, but you've got colors and crunches and different things. Yes? I've also heard it called a gumball machine. Oh, nice! I haven't heard of that one before. Adds a little sweetness in there to that. Okay, so I'll have to put the mixed salad up for the health conscious and then the uh, gumballs for the sugar eaters. Thank you. <laughs> so this is, this is happening. And um, the second largest Spanish-speaking market in the world is the U.S. So if you think about that, you can go to Mexico to get the largest Spanish-speaking market, but before you even start thinking about going to Peru or Argentina or Spain, you can target Spanish speakers right here in the U.S. And if you, um, whoops. And if you go on to Spanish speaking TV, which I get a kick during the Olympics, I always watch it when I get the, when I control the remote and when I have the room to myself, I put on Spanish speaking TV because I speak a little Spanish and I get a kick out of watching the ads because it's all the same manufacturers and companies that are up there. You've got Toyota, you've got McDonald's, you've got Procter and Gamble, all those products are up there. And if you flip between the stations, they're the same ads, but translated and adapted for the market. So without even re leaving the borders here, you've got a huge market you can go after. So now let's talk about the internet. You've got 3.5 billion internet users in the world, and a billion of those will identify that they speak English. But that's not their first language. And so it's tempting to say English is the global language. I'm just going to keep my sight in English. But that's really going to do you a disservice. So here's some internet statistics that I talked about. 
90% of the people always want to visit a site in their native language. So you got the majority who want to use their native language. 72%, boy, that's hard to see, uh, spend most of their time on sites in their native language. So they people prefer it, and most of the time they're just going to stay in it. 42% um, of European consumers never purchase if the site is not in their native language. 72% are more apt to buy, and over half are willing to spend more money if it's in their language. So um, if, even though you may be tempted, or your clients may be tempted to keep their languages, uh, to their sites in English, it's much better to provide it in native language. And you know, marketing, you want people to feel comfortable, and if it's in language, they're gonna feel more comfortable. Now let's just look at the pure number of search volume with Google. You've got two trillion searches per year, and that breaks down into about 5.5 billion searches a day. And 50% um, of the searches are done outside of the US, and it's the preferred search engine for 12 out of the 15 GDP countries in the world. So put, translating your stuff and getting it into the Google search engine is not only going to help people in the United States, the Spanish and Russian and Haitian Creole and German and um, whatever, the Korean and Japanese and all the languages we have here in the US, but you're going to start reaching the other countries and developing an interest. Okay, let's talk about some cautionary tales of translation. Some things, this is to kind of wake you up and give you some humor. So, ask part of the brain. I got a call from somebody who said, you know, my toys are really selling, and I've narrowed it down to um, this website, and I put it into Google Translate, and it says that the toy stimulates the ass part of the brain. Do you have any idea what that means? So we could take him and help him, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more in a case study with that. All right, I got my Spanish speaker back there. You speak Spanish too. You speak Spanish too. Okay, I said I got. I, I can pick out the language. Anybody want to volunteer? Okay, so I let you. Give me an example of where you'd say I. I Coca Cola. Like at a restaurant or when you open a refrigerator, like when I'm looking for something. Right. So you'd open it up. I bananas? <laughs> yeah, so I'm asking for something. I would use that. Right. So the literal the the, the transliteration translation is um, is there is there bananas is there a coca-cola okay so somebody who didn't know Spanish very well translated got milk the old campaign into I leche so it makes sense right well not if you really understand the language who wants to tell me what it means is there milk there is milk no it's sexual no, it's not sexual. Yeah, it depends on country, it can be sexual, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. It's the Spanish I know, that would definitely be sexual. Okay, well, the Spanish that I've heard is, is are you lactating? So it's mother child. So I can only imagine what that is. It depends on the country, yeah. It depends on the country. Yeah, yes, it does, it does. <laughs> Um, okay, so this, this is the kind of thing where if you have somebody that doesn't fully understand the language that it's going into, or the country, or what it is, these are the kind of things that you can want, run into. Um, I just put uh, pictures of her up because uh, she did a beautiful shoot in... Um, a magazine. It was about six months ago, and I just I thought she was beautiful for coming out for how strong she was. So love that. Okay, I need a large straight man to come up here next to me. Come on up. So pretend you're Larry. Hello. You're uh, hi, Larry. How are you this evening? Fine, thank you. How are you? Good. So Larry, you are the owner of the Gentle Giant Moving Company. Does everybody know the Gentle Giant Moving Company? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, it's big. I know Larry, the owner. He told me this great story. So imagine here, Larry goes over to China. He's on vacation. Hey, hold on. 
<laughs> Very many languages. Okay, so you're walking by here, and you come across this table with this guy who will create a t-shirt for you, and you can put anything on it that you want. Okay, and you're like, well, cool. Cool. I own the gentle giant. I own the gentle giant moving company. I would like a t-shirt with gentle giant. I would like a t-shirt with gentle giant. So he makes you a t-shirt and you put it on and you walk through China and everybody laughs at him. Come on, laugh, laugh. <laughs> And he says, what does Why is everyone laughing at me? <laughs> and she looks and she laughs and she says, Oh, well in China, gentle means homosexual. So you've been walking around with a shirt that says large homosexual man. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Thank you for your help, Larry. So on this one, it's an example of if you hire somebody that doesn't actually know the language um, and has not trained as a translator, then um, people will take liberties and just try to assume what, what you mean as opposed to asking for clarification as to what it's about. Okay, so let's get into translation and some of the questions you were asking about version of languages, geography, quality check like on Facebook, and who determines. So there's been a whole lot of talk about um, machine translation. Google translation, AI, neurolinguistic program is coming out, the algorithms are kind of going by the wayside. Um, and is that good enough quality? Well, I just, it's like nails on the chalkboard to me when I go to a website and I see the Google Translate plugin on there. Number one, the quality is so poor if you're really trying to connect with your audience. Um, it's not there yet, and so there, you know, people are coming in saying, oh, now there's AI and NLP, is that gonna put you out of business? And at this point, I'm not worried. I have a dictionary from the 1930s that's really thin, and um, if I hold it up to the one I got in high school, which is really old, it's about this thick, and they're adding um, hundreds of words to the dictionary every year. Like if you just think of self, selfie, FOMO, um, you know, words like this that are coming out all the time. I'm gonna Google it. Um, they're adding words in. I heard they took out mulberry, which is kind of surprising to me because you can't just do away with a berry that's still around. But there's a continual juggling of language. And then you have the I leche example, which in one country it can mean one thing, in another country it can mean something else. So just as in here in the United States, if we read something that's from uh, London or from um, British English, we know that it's different. Now we may understand it, but it's different. So there's word choices that go around. So at this point, I'm not worried about um, any, any automated technology translation putting me out of business because we run a quality translation firm. But what I am fascinated by it uh, are some of the uses. So like Facebook, um, nobody's gonna pay for a quality translation on that. I've got a classmate that lives over in Tokyo. She posts in Japanese and sometimes I just wanna say, you know, I can see it's a picture of her child so I want to see what was going on. I can get the gist of it. So it's a gist translation, but it's not quality. Um, Google Translate, if you get an email from around the world and you want to pop it in and see what it is, you can put it in there and see if somebody's asking you to send large sums of money or if it's an actual business request. Um, so, I, you know, I love what machine translation has done because now instead of getting asked translation, where would I use that? People are saying, well, how do I get the quality? Or how would I know which version to pick? Or how do I know that it's going to be culturally adapted? Um, where technology is really making a difference is um, in certain situations. Like if you're a lawyer and you've got a huge amount of um, content and it only a certain amount is gonna be applicable to your case, then you can run that through machine translation and you can get just the part that you need, have that done 
um, for quality translation and then put that into um, the, as an exhibit in your law case. Um, another one that I heard that's more website marketing is TripAdvisor. They have a very standard way of writing, and so if it's always written the same way, then translation memory can pick it up and put it in. Translation memory is something that we use uh, as a translation agency because if we've translated something once, we want the consistency of voice, we want the same terms, um, and we're saving costs for clients that we can run it through the memory and then just have the new material translated. So technology has been absolutely incredible that way um, to automate some things. Now, terminology. As we're talking about a translation, it's good to know. Translation is written, interpretation is spoken. So this is really important to know when you're, you're looking at getting something done because they're two different kinds of people. Translators are, um, they're more intellectual, they'll quote dictionaries to me, they're fully bilingual, they're trained, they know grammar like there's no tomorrow, and whereas interpreters are the people who like to run around and help facilitate conversations. Now when you get into translation, you asked a lot of good questions, is how do I pick which to use? So if I ha have a manufacturing company and I'm writing a technical manual, one good Spanish is probably going to do me fine. So I will globalize the material so I can use it in all the Spanish-speaking parts of the world. Localization is what you're going to see um, say Adidas, they go out with a soccer ball, I'll stick with my Pele. Um, if they're marketing a soccer ball, soccer ball, in each country, they're gonna have a different sports figure up there, they're gonna refer to different teams. If you can buy this, the soccer ball online, they're gonna have the local currency on there, they're gonna have images from that country. So when you've got a consumer product, it, that's when you wanna start thinking about localizing it and really taking it to that um, right down in there. And that's when you think about which dialect to pick. So if you're marketing something just in Mexico, then you're going to use a Mexican Spanish translator because Mexican and um, Puerto Rican Spanish is the most anglicized, so that's where you can see the difference. Um, we did get somebody that um, had a French translation and they said, you know, we used it and it's for Canada and we're getting really bad feedback on it. And so we brought it to our Canadian tr our translator, uh, French translator, and they said, oh, this was done in a Haitian Creole French. And that's very different. So that's when you start having to pay attention to, it's not just somebody who's bilingual, but thinking about where it's going to be used. Um, and if it's going to be globalized, what is the cleanest language that you can do? Um, anybody speak Portuguese here? Portuguese? Meza, meza. <laughs> um, Portuguese is, Spoken can be understood between Portugal and Brazil, but the written forms of the language are very, very different. Whereas in China, there's only two forms of written Chinese, but lots of dialects. So sometimes you'll see people drawing characters on their hand because they can communicate that way. Um, so in China, all of China, there's only one written form, which is simplified Chinese. Okay, then you get into multilingual chat, which is interesting. So if it's a chat bot, it's written, it's translation. But if it's live chat, I get a chuckle out of this because it's translation because it's written, but it's interpretation really because it's live. So there's a lot of stuff going on in this area um, where you can outsource and we're a provider of this um, multilingual chat because people are less likely to call on phones now than they are to do, to do chat. And then telephone interpreting is on demand, interpreter services, and an extension from that is uh, VRI, which is video remote interpreting. All right, so 
say you have a client and they come to you and they want their uh, website translated and it used to be I'd get a call, they'd ask for a quote, I'd say, okay, we can quote it for you, they'd get sticker shock and they'd say, I don't know, we're not going to do this, but I've, you know, we go back and we look at the website and we can see that only part of the material needs to be translated. So I always say, have your corporate strategy, have your marketing strategy, and then your multilingual strategy aligns. Then you can start looking at technology, whether you're gonna do a um, TripAdvisor type product, um, te leveraging technology, what, what it, it, information could be done um, by machine, and what needs to be done by humans for high quality. Quality, and then what's the process for getting it done? I see a lot of companies that, you know, they just haphazard send it out and it's not streamlined. So when you're developing a website, you can really help them think that through. Um, and then we're looking at the, the wheel of all the different things that can affect and who it is and, and that's how you can decide what you do. Okay, so some case studies. So the ass part of the brain. This was an example of somebody that called up, it was Ken, he said, you know, my, my toy is really selling, I want to translate the whole website, it was going to cost him a few thousand dollars, he's a small business, he didn't want to do that, I recommended he go back to Google Translate, find the part that he wants, called me back up and started laughing, it's the ass part of the brain, I really want to know what they're saying, so it ended up being a couple hundred dollars, so. Um, we wouldn't have gotten the job for the expense that it was, but I also love using technology in a way that it can, so he got the information that he wanted there. Conatech Sunoco is another one. They um, do packaging around the world. They've got all sorts of um, different kinds of packaging and, and different things sold. They, they're made up of a lot of acquisitions. Huge project to redo their website. Um, and when they were looking, they want to do uh, translation, they, they did translation, we handled it for them, and then they also want to now go forward and do their social media. So what we ended up doing was getting a large spreadsheet, um, putting in there which products are sold in what countries, so then we could narrow it down, we could look across what countries they were going in, whether they needed a different translation, or whether it would be fine if they gave a global globalized translation, which um, they did for most of their languages, and then they could narrow down to translate just what they wanted. Now with social media, if you're uh, getting into that, then a lot of the translation from the website, you may be using some of the same terminology, you want to keep reusing it, you do an editorial calendar, you plan it out month by month, and then translation can be loaded and um, sent out on time. Medical Foundation, this is something where we use the WPML plugin. Now we were talking about this earlier today. How many people have used the WPML plugin? Okay, you've done translation and you've done the plugin. The advanced student today. <laughs> So this, um, the Medical Foundation here in Boston, um, they provide health information and they do it across languages and they redid their website and they wanted to put the information out. So they, we work with them to get the WPML plugin in. Then what that does is hook up to our API, it pulls the content in, puts it into our translation memory software so we could do the, the um, high quality human translation and then push it right back up to the website. So it saves a lot of the um, manual manipulation of that. Okay, so let's look at, this is the example without leveraging any technology. It's about a 21 step process when we actually looked at it for going back and forth and having the re review and everything. Once we added the, um, the WPML plugin, the API, um, and then putting it into the translation program that we use, um, we're still leveraging complete humans, but this is a really good use for, translate, for um, technology. Okay, some suggestions. If you get a client that asks you for a translation, um, first, if they ask about the Google plugin, 
I really talked to him against it. It's not even worth putting it up on a website. And then I was doing some research on where people were using it. Not only do they put the Google Translate plugin in, oftentimes it's buried down on the bottom of the site. So if you imagine this is all in Chinese, the website, and you've got to scroll all the way down to the bottom, and then you find the little logo because you recognize Google plugin, you do the drop down menu. Then they even keep languages all in English. So if you speak Chinese, you got to know how Chinese is spelled out. Now just imagine yourself looking at a Chinese website and trying to pick out how, what English looks like in Chinese characters. Um, so, um, and what was the other funny one that I laughed at? That's, that they're using it, that they put it at the bottom of the page, and then the languages aren't translated. Okay, global English writing. You wouldn't know that that's a thing, but it is. If you use um, flowery languages, lots of jokes, words, um, to try to get a double meaning in, um, local references, like if I were to use something and say, oh, it's wicked cool that I came here tonight, then that is going to be very difficult to translate. Um, we had a situation where there was a tagline, it's all about getting better, and it was for a hospital. And so was it about the patient getting better, or was it about the hospital providing better services? both in English, right? Well, it was a Haitian Creole translation, and the translator said, you can't do that. You've got to have a subject for it. So that's the kind of thing you, you want to think about when you're writing, and then why you want to have a translator that's professionally trained, because they know to come back and ask these questions. Um, more space. If you're designing a website in WordPress or any program or any app, allow more space. We say at least 20% because if you say something in one language, it's going to take more space to say it in another. My favorite example is Farfuk Nougat, the pleasure of driving. It's four words. So more space. Repeat copy is an ideal time for translation memory or stay consistent with your translator. We've worked with Tomi. Um, they do the Thomas the Tank Engines and all those, you know, take and toss. And if you've had kids, you've had their products. Um, they used us for years. And one year before I bought the company, they decided to shop out their catalog. And the prior owner told me about this. They shopped it out, um, found a cheaper resource. They took the catalog into the sales floor. All the salespeople are at the, the conference. And they couldn't tell which products went to what because when we had done the packaging translation, we had given it one name. And then the catalog had given it another name. So that's where consistency of translator leveraging and translation memory comes important. And final version. You know how you work with clients and they say, oh yeah, it's final, and you put it all up there and they start doing edits? That's a nightmare for version control. So if you get edits and you're working across seven different languages to make sure each little edit is captured everywhere. So we you know, really encourage your, your clients to make sure to go to final copy. Uh, final content. Okay, then there's funny little things like this. Staples came up with this um, tagline, make more happen. But they could take the more out and they could substitute things in. So uh, make work happen, make fun happen, make refrigerator art happen. Who can tell me what refrigerator art is? Kids, you know, kids drawings. kids' drawings that you're so proud of you hang up on the refrigerator. Right, so it's like a standard thing here in the U.S. The French translator looked at it and said, no, the refrigerator is for keeping things cold. We don't hang art on our refrigerator. So that tagline had no um, meaning. So that was one issue with it that we had to check across languages. And then the other was, is this is nice because it bookends, make it happen, but the more comes out. There was a little frustration with the um, 
the uh, English speaking marketing people because they're like, oh, it's so cool how it's bookend, but you couldn't do that in a lot of the other languages. So it took a lot more time of thinking it through. So marketing translation does have a lot of specifics in it that you want to watch out for. Okay, now quality control. One of your questions was asking about that. Like, how do you, um, how do you check quality control? There's different ways to do it. One is, 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 is if we have a school that has a parental letter that they need translated, if you put a good translator on them, you have them proofread it, it's going to be fine because their title budget is probably a short letter. Um, you can get away with that. If it's something really important, we suggest you have an editor on it because the way we caught the um, it's all about getting better is because the translator read it one way and then the editor, ed editor said, no, I'm not reading it that way, I'm reading it this way. So they went back and forth and then we knew to take it back to the client. So an editor is going to look for something if that, you know, if it's poorly written English or it's got a double meaning or um, it might not be culturally appropriate or, um, you know, slight grammar mistakes, it's going to be caught in editing. So anything complex, long or tricky or really could give you liability, that's when you want to have an editor on it. Um, an internal review is up in the light green. That um, would be, the, we think the best place for this is if you've done, if it's something really important, have a translator, have an editor, and then have it go through your internal folks. I, I, sometimes editing with the internal folks works well, but sometimes um, they'll try to make it more colloquial or they'll change the grammar isn't okay. We've even had people that took high school Spanish, tried to edit something, and just made it completely incorrect. We've had people try to change the message um, because it might be a distributor and they want to put a sales message on it rather than a marketing message. So internal folks are good for that last proof, um, but editing, and you always want to circle back with your original translator. Back translation, don't recommend that at all. That's like whisper down the alley. So I translate it, somebody else translates it back into the original English to see if it captures, but we could use the words dinner and supper interchangeably. Okay, so SEO. Um, if you use Google Translate, the plugin in there, that will come up with um, some cloning language in there, so it will hurt your SEO. Keyword search terms, we talked about, you know, whether they're called keywords or search terms or search intent or intent data or whatever, whatever they're going by now, you know what I mean with you got to get the right words in there. Um, you got to spend time on doing this and having somebody trained on how to translate it, but then also not just give you the one word, but different ways that it could be said in the language can help. hreflang and href country tags, anybody familiar with these? There are tags that you can put in that will identify where somebody's coming from by language or by country, and they have ISO standards for these. So, um, and you can't just guess at them because you might think that SP would be Spanish, but it could be Spain, just like ES for Espanol or España. So you really have to look down the list and make sure you're using them accurately. Now, when you're using a website, there's a whole bunch of different ways to do it. And that is, um, you can recognize the IP from where somebody's coming from or what their browser is set at to have it automatically come up in that. One thing I want to make sure is if you're designing a website to make to keep the upper right hand side globe, um, so somebody can switch languages. So for example, if it has a country tag in the US, it might come up only showing English, but say I'm one of those Spanish speakers that doesn't speak English here in the United States, then I want to be able to go over to the drop down access to be able to get it. So even if you start getting to the point where you're putting the tags in, still give the option. Um, Test and measure, I talked earlier about the German um, inquiries a client was getting. If you're watching what countries or what languages, well, I guess it would have to be countries or locations people are coming in from, um, that's where you can start 
you know, advising your clients, the clients on what languages they might want to go into. And so this is a value-added service that you can add for them. And then keeping a glossary um, is so you're consistent across all the terms that you're doing. And that, you know, we capture that in the machine translation and watching for that. Costs. All right, so this is the CEO um, of, okay, so if you start out with the strategy and you look at your process and technology to get the quality that you need, if you think about the websites that are going out, we had a medical clinic here um, just outside of Boston that was translating their website. They had a lot of content. What they figured out is their homepage, any of their authorization forms, um, information on how to schedule an appointment, cancel an appointment, that was all value-add information and the services they provided. But all their bios on the doctors, all their press releases, all that information didn't need to be translated. So really, you can save a lot of money for a client helping them do that. And on the other hand, you can open up a whole new world for them too. Costs have gotten really interesting in the industry. Um, it, 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 the industry is now kind of known as its cost per word for translation. And some of the companies have started playing games where what they'll do is they'll give a really low cost per word and then all the extras are added in, like, oh, proofreading is extra and quality control is extra. And um, let's see, a the Da, 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 what a rush jobs, oh, it's difficult subject matter, oh, you're gonna need process improvement and monitoring and advice, you know, and that'll be added in. And so we did a research study um, and also the, the Industry Association did a study. And what we found, like we kept hearing, oh, your prices are so much higher. And when we looked at it, we figured out that's what was going on. We were giving a fully loaded cost per word and other companies were, were dropping that out. So when you're looking at a quote, make sure you're comparing apples to apples. Um, variables, if you have a character language, more likely that's going to be more expensive. If you have something highly technical, um, that's going to be more expensive. Um, if you ask for a rush, good baseline is allow about the same amount of time to translate as you would to write something. Now, you can go out and you can get crowdsourced translation. That would be really cheap. Um, some places that might work really well, like the WordPress community, they're one of the places that I think are, are doing the crowdsourcing technology, um, crowdsource translation for the technology. So all the back end um, programming stuff for WordPress. I, I've watched that on, on the um, chat groups. Um, that I was talking about earlier, and, and, and I think they've done a good job. If you've got a company that anything is confidential, anything that's proprietary, anything that they want to own the language, like copyright their marketing language, I'd be very careful about crowdsourcing. And um, if, if a price looks too good to be true, just ask who they're having it um, do the translation. Um, Add-ons are going to be if there's any. Oh, don't don't code your words into your images because it's really hard to translate and then get back in. So lay the text over it so it's a text box and then it can be easy easily edited. Um, thinking about maintenance, pulling together uh, a way so if there are changes made to the content or you add a blog or you add something figure out what your process is to communicate that across so the translation gets updated too. We've seen people that are continually monitoring their English website and they turn around about two years later and say, oh, we haven't done any of this. We haven't updated our, our languages. So then it gets to be a much more complex, busy um, project. Um, and then, then uh, always ask what what happens if you aren't happy with the translation. So, I, I when I first started running the company, I'd get a call saying, "Oh, 
you know, somebody said the translation wasn't good and I'd have heart failure and lose my breath. And, and now I, I, I say, okay, let's go through and figure out why. And oftentimes it's, um, you know, somebody has a, a preferred word choice or it's a word they use in the industry or they're turning it to a colloquial and it should be something, you know, colloquial grammar when it should be proper grammar because it's in writing. Or um, you know the high school Spanish student who shouldn't be reviewing it in the first place. Um, we've had community groups that review it, and they really feel like they should have their insight into it, so they'll edit it all up. But when we push back on it, they're like, "Well, yeah, no, you could say it this way." So there's there's a lot in there, but always make sure that your translator holds the final version because if you ever go back for updates, you want to make sure that they have agreed to it and um, and signed off on it, and they have the current. We carry a uh, also we carry a liability insurance policy. So if we do a translation for you and you go off and train change it and you don't tell us and there's a problem with it, it's not gonna the liability insurance isn't gonna cover for it. Okay, so there is a cost to it, but when I've talked to the really large companies that have the internal departments, what they're starting to do is track the return on it. So this is another good way when you're talking to your clients and they're, you know, gasping at the price of translation or thinking they can't do it, these are the different measurements that you can think about doing it. So if you, you think about in a um, marketing way, you need to attract, you need to um, win them, and then you need to ret retain them. So you can increase your leads, you can connect more with the customer, and then you can provide services in there. So it's going to grow the pie, and it's going to keep the pie bigger. Um, and then liability is also something um, to think about, because if something is put out there wrong, um, it can be a big, big liability, more so than just a laughing thing. Um, and recruiting and retaining employees, if you've got a happy workforce, that goes out to your clients and then they pull that in. So we're working on a bilingual initiative because manufacturers are having a hard time hiring people in the area, but if they hire non-English speakers, they, they find that they're keeping them longer. So if you're working with websites that are trying to attract and retain people. Um, resources, if you love the funny um, homosexual large man things, we uh, do a bunch of tidbits. We have a tidbit book that we can download. I mean, not we, you can download. If you want to get our tidbits, we send them out twice a month, and um, I get a lot of good comments on that. They're quick. You don't even, you, you can open them, read about it, and click through if you want to uh, go something else. We do have a WordPress translation guide, so if you, you know, come across a situation you want to read about it, you can do that. Otherwise, you can get a free MMA, multilingual marketing assessment. Um, and just about us, we've got the 100% satisfaction guarantee, um, and we really make sure to put your, your um, the right person on the job. And we have 100% on time delivery. And these are the services. I say we do anything from one language to another, um, except teaching. So that's an area that we don't get into. But you know, all the website and the marketing area. So. Did I answer all your questions? Yes, you did. Yes, I did? OK. Do, is, do we have any other questions? Oh, yeah, I have my cards up here. So if anybody has further questions, I'd love to help you. Any other questions? Yes? For someone interested in serving just a block, strictly a block, are there advantages to translating the entries, the posts? Um, it would depend on what the blog is about and who your target audience is and what you hope to achieve. Yeah. So and I could talk to you more unless you want to share. <laughs> yeah, I'll grab the card. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and that, it, it, you know, if anybody's willing to share on anything, I can talk you through how I work through a strategy of what to do and then how to figure out the rest of it. Yes? I do have one question. So, um, YouTube has, like, the closed captioning that you can do on, like, videos. Um, and so I follow this one um, woman from New York who she's a vegan food bomber. And so she's noticed that, like, whenever she tries to do um, YouTube, 
use a closed captioning that YouTube automatically says it doesn't work. Um, and so she's gone in trying to like do it herself because a lot of her followers have asked her to do closed captioning. Um, but like on the accessibility piece, do you have any suggestions? Is that something that your company works with? Because I know that like um, there are a couple of companies that recently got sued for accessibility um, on websites. Like Beyonce is getting sued right now. Domino's is getting sued. So what what other things can we do for accessibility? Because you know like languages is obviously a big part of that as well. Yes, it's interesting. I was just talking to a company about it. Um, they talk, They were talking about accessibility, but it was only the visually impaired or the hard of hearing. And I said, well, what about languages? Well, that, that has nothing to do with accessibility. I'm like, yes, it does. Okay, so first some definitions. Subtitles are languages underneath. Closed captioning is for the hard of hearing. Okay. In subtitles, you'd see just the words translated. Closed captioning, you'd also see in parentheses, groan, scary music, you know, that kind of thing. So that, that, that's the difference between the two, which isn't commonly known. Um, and so we do um, close, we do subtitle, we do closed captioning, and then there's voiceover if you want to make it accessible to different languages. And it's interesting because if you're preparing a video that's going to go to other parts of the world, you can do subtitles. It's cheaper because you're just doing the translation and you lay it over. If you do a voiceover, you've got to have talent that actually does the voice recording. Um, and so other parts of the world are so used to movies from Hollywood or Netflix that they, they're they familiar with reading subtitles and don't have as big a problem with it. Um, a lot of people in the U.S. say, oh, I don't watch movies with subtitles on them because it's too hard. So here we more tend to have the voiceovers. Um, but if you look at ages, millennials tend to like sub uh, voiceovers more because they're multitasking. They're listening to something as they're typing too. So again, it goes back to the, the use, the accessibility, what you're targeting as to, as to what you do. That's a good question. Yeah, because video is taking off, and how do you handle that? I'm kind of interested in the WordPress plugin that you're talking about. Um, if you can talk about it a little bit, but also a specific question I have about it is, um, does it like pre-translate it and save it like in the database? Because I know WordPress, all the content is saved in the database and then rendered to the page from outside of it. So is it? Is it something that does it like on the fly, like in the moment, or does it translate it and save it so that you can, you know, do all these checks and uh, processes that you're talking about? So WPML is a plugin that you can put into the WordPress site that you develop. So when we're working with a client, we talk them through putting the plugin in so it connects to our API, so it goes into our translation um, management software. And in there, then we look at all the original source text and put it into the target text. So it's a human that's doing that and pushing it back out. Now I was talking to, who were we talking to earlier that had the W? Um, from BU, yeah, <laughs> he left. Um, he's got a site that he's doing from WordGive that's a nonprofit that has the WPML um, plugin into it. See, the WPML, you really have to hook it up to something. So you might be able to hook it up with machine translation, but then you got all the quality issues that you're looking at. And so I'd say, why bother? There's some people that are doing machine translation with the human editing, but any qualified translators are looking at that saying, ah, oh, it's just not, it doesn't read smooth. And so they say, I'd rather start over than edit something that's been done by a machine. So WPML, you can use to handle different trans the translations in different ways and you really need to think what's going on. Now, in Joe's situation, Joe, right? Jim. Jim, Jim, that's okay. In Jim's situation, he's, his client is in Panama, and their site is in Spanish. They have WPML, 
and they're using it to do English, but the people are loading the content in Spanish and then they're loading it in English. So WPML is just an extra plugin because they're not really using it. So he's just gonna make it so they can load it up there because they have bilingual speakers in house. So you, you gotta think about, you know, what's your strategy and then let's make a process and does it make sense to put the WPML plugin in? Did that answer? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's it's done for him and uh, not on the fly because if you need a person to do it, then you'd have to have some time to do it, right? Yeah. Yes. And even if you think about TED Talks where you get the subtitles underneath there, looks like it's on the fly. It's not. The, the, the talk has been pre-recorded, it's been translated, and then they low, so it looks like it's live, but it's not. So there's still a lot of human intervention for um, quality. But there is, okay, so I'll say that, but then we also have a cool technology that's taking off. Um, it, 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 my tech person has worked with it a lot, I haven't. But it's a step up from Google Translate, so a speaker, like here, I'm speaking in English, and it plugs into the microphone, and then people who have the app on the phone can stream the, um, transcription in another language. And so it's really good for cases where an interpreter wouldn't have been provided, but you're leveraging technology to make the situation better than it was before. So you think of Comic-Con, you know, the huge number of people that go there, they're not gonna set up a box and offer headsets to each person that wants translation on it. But for less money, they can plug that in and have, um, have everybody come from around the world and listen in. So there's, there's a, lot, a lot going on, and that's where we're really saying, okay, we'll do any, we'll figure out what you need to do. Um, that's kind of our, our angle on it. So, you know, keep asking, ask the same question a year from now, you might get <laughs> There's this new technology out there. Other questions? I don't know if this really applies to what you necessarily do, but for visually impaired, <coughs> if, um, say, in, in the context of a blog, if the words could be read out different translations of it. Not blind necessarily, but who... So I go from the blog to the spoken language in a different language. Exactly. <laughs> it, maybe it's not an option. Mm, I'd have to think it through. Huh? You can always, um, so what someone would do with like a, a, vision, a vision impairment is that they would download a plugin to read it back to them, um, but they're not always the best. It just depends like what version. We download a free one. They're not always very good, and it also is up to the coder of that website to make sure that the website is accessible for that type of plugin or for any type of thing. So let's say you have an internet website and it doesn't load. If I'm using a voiceover um, and, it, and there isn't a backup. Um, like source for the image itself, it won't, I, I'll just say that there's an image, but it won't tell me what's in the image. But like, just like you were saying, there has to be a lot of human intervention for it to be a, a little bit more accessible. And it's only the little things that make a big difference for some people. Right. Yeah. Right, and you're talking the same language. Yeah. Yeah, she was asking, can you go to a different language? There, there, are, there are some plugins available um, for that kind of stuff. It's just like a matter of like, finding them. Um, the one that my grandma uses is it free. It costs us like about $150, but um, it, it, it is possible to, to find them. But uh, again, it comes, and the other thing is like, it's not every website that gets translated is only certain things because of the technology and, and like the, the user availability for, for the connection between the two softwares. Yeah. Better answer than I have. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you everybody. <laughs>